loving what you're hearing? Well, the establishment hates it. And right now, they're conjuring up new ways to try and censor RCR. To ensure you never miss a beat of the hard-hitting news you've come to know and love, make sure you're on the RCR mailing list. Get connected now at realitycheck.radio forward slash email. John Key once thanked David Farah for his excellent polling that helped Key win an election. I never bet against David because he always has the data. He's on the line now to discuss the attempted assassination of Donald Trump, what that means for polls, as well as explain the latest Taxpayers Union Curia poll. Uh, with me now is David Farrer, probably New Zealand's best pollster, although he'll probably defer to that uh, comment, won't you, David? I'll let other people describe me. Uh, some some say very good things, some say less flattering things. <laughs> well, let me tell you something uh, to the listeners. I never bet against David Farrer's reckons because he's got the numbers. <laughs> well, data helps. Yeah, we all have opinions, but opinions backed on data, yeah, tend to be a bit better. Well, that's the thing. Opinions are like noses. Everybody has one. So the latest Taxpayers Union Courier poll came out on Friday last week. Uh, there's a little bit of coverage in the mainstream media, but there's some quite uh, interesting developments in this poll compared to the last couple, isn't there? Yeah, but the biggest one is Christopher Luxon's um, gone up around 10% as preferred PM. Mm. Um I think that's a bit exaggerated. If you look at the poll before, he dropped by a bit. And so what I think happened is that was probably a bit exaggerated, the drop last time. So he's probably, if you look to two months ago, he's up sort of 4% or so. Makes sense in, in one way, though, because he's been doing the statesman-like stuff overseas, et cetera, and that's all positive. It doesn't result in negative stories. Mm. Uh, there. So basically it's, you know, government looks like it's getting on and governing. Bit of a surprise maybe is the Greens are still holding up high. In fact, it's Labour who's been a bit invisible has dropped 3%. But the Greens seem to sort of have a brand where we don't care that their last four MPs have been bullies or shoplifters or allegedly migrant exploiters. We still like the Greens. Yeah, it's, it's Chloe. <laughs> Is it's worth mentioning there's up to 11% preferred PM, which is very high for a third party leader. And very high for someone who always just delivers a word soup of nothingness. I'll give her some credit for the Darlene Tana investigation. I saw her press conference there was pretty strong because she actually said this is so unacceptable, we feel betrayed, she lied to us, there wasn't sort of, she could have been more weasel words there, but she was pretty clear about the moral condemnation, etc. But yes, look, she, she's like Jacinda, she's a hero to, to young women. Yeah, but but this is the interesting thing, the Greens are staying high, they've got Julianne Genter, who's still to go before the Privileges Committee, yep. uh, who also has got allegations of assault by you know, shopkeepers have complained about being assaulted by her. You know, actually, physical hands-on. They throw Darlene Tana under the bus, but there isn't a peep about Julianne Genter and her behaviour. No, because Julianne's more valuable to them. And the end, you know, politics is a sort of how bad is it what you've done versus how useful are you to us? When you're a new backbench list MP who's been there a few months and you're getting bad headlines, wash, you're gone. When you're the person who's have identified most with the public transport policies there, uh, they'll be far more forgiving of, of what you've done. Yeah, it's hypocrisy though, isn't it? Well, no, yeah, it, it, it is because... Look, what Julian did isn't capital hanging offence, but I always think about what if we reversed it if a New Zealand national male MP had gone to the other side of the house and shouted and berated Julianne when she was a minister, it would have been the only story for days on end with people Until that national violence national and howling. <laughs> yeah. and so there is that double standard there. 
Yeah, yeah, totally. And that's the media's double standard as well. Yes, very, very much so. And, and you know, we've even seen this with the um, Trump shooting. Now, look, I don't think you should be blaming Biden or any Democrat for this, but when Gabby Giffords, a Democratic congresswoman, got shot, everyone piled on to Sarah Palin because she'd done an image showing her a few months earlier as one of the targets for seats they won with, with a bullseye around them, et cetera. And the Democrats had done similar with Trump. They talked about he's a target. We, we need to make him a bullseye. And I don't think that's so a violence, but it's the double standard. Yeah. I mean, Joe Biden uh, put on his Facebook just – literally uh, two hours before yes. it, it attempted assassination of, of Trump. Americans want a president, not a dictator. And this seems to be a, a, um, a theme of the democratic uh, process, that they're trying to paint Donald Trump as some kind of Julius Caesar and therefore justified in eliminating him. You've got you know congressmen who said that, that, that Trump is a threat to democracy and he needs to be eliminated. Just days ago was saying yeah. with the Julius Caesar one of the funnier memes was what someone say Biden press conference where he says I remember the shooting of Ronald Reagan and of John F Kennedy and of Julius Caesar <laughs> <laughs> well I was surprised that we didn't see Biden announce that he had just met New Zealand's uh, Prime Minister Sir Robert Muldoon or Jacinda like Jacinda you've aged <laughs> well, that's a nice haircut you've got there yeah. <laughs> Just astonishing. Anyway, back to the Taxpayers Union poll. We'll talk about the the uh, attempted assassination shortly, but back to the Taxpayers Union poll. Uh, the headline numbers show an improvement for the government, though, don't they? Yeah, look, 57 seats, 67, where you need 162 to govern. That's yep. a pretty comfortable margin. Um, it's, in the MMP, you, you, you really will get much more than that, except, of course, when there was that Labour landslide, et cetera. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, that's a pretty comfortable one for them. Still going to come down to results. I think at the end, the last election was a vote for change, and people want to see that change. They want to see a better economy, better public services, et cetera. Uh, but what I saw from that poll was they think the government's starting to get on with it, and they're going to you know, give give them a go. Yeah, I mean, if there is quite a, a distinct gap between Labour and National that has opened up now, and and that's the to me when I, you know we're looking at these polls when National and Labour are very close, then the election's very close. When there is a, a significant gap there, it, it's not you know those third parties aren't ever going to make that gap up, and especially when the third parties are the lunatics of the Greens and the absolutely insane racists of the of the Maori Party. Yeah, I agree with you there. There's two factors. One is, look, if you're polling in the 20s, you just don't get the moral mandate to form a government, even if technically you can get there on the maths. You know? yeah, yeah. Um, but the second thing is I think Labour's biggest problem in the next election will be that the only way it looks like they could form a government would be with both the Greens and the Māori Party. Now, Greens have been outside cabinet in the past. They've not been in cabinet. But Te Pahi Māori have never been in a position where they actually hold the balance of power, i.e. they can bring the government down. Uh, when they were in agreement with John Key's government, he didn't need them. He did it because he thought it would be a nice thing to do. Yeah, so, and I think when you do look at how radical and even anti-democratic they have become, there will be increasing pressure on Labour to distance themselves from them um, come the election. If I was doing National's campaign, I'd very much be saying that that's your weak point that you want to target. Not because they are a part here advocate for Maori, but because they're a party that actually has some extremely bad policies. Do you think Darlene Tana might uh, walk a jump and call the bluff of the Greens? And go oh, to Maori I don't think she's going anywhere. Um, I think she probably would go to Te Pahi Maori if they would have her, and it would be an interesting sign of how politically smart they are if they took her or not, because they shouldn't. That's one thing to take... Uh, 
former Labor minister who's basically not performing well, who's just walker jump really for ambition. No great look, but that's okay. But this, you know, taking someone who's been alleged of migrant exploitation would look really bad. So I think Darlene will probably stay in independent. I think they could sell that to their voters, though, uh, David. You know, I could just imagine it. You'd have John Tamahiri saying, look, we've decided that because of the way uh, Darling Tana has uh, acted uh, towards Tauiwi, that we're going to take her on board. And, and, and Rauri Waititi would say, good on you, Darling. You know, you showed those um, those uh, settlers uh, exactly how they should be treated. And they, 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 the rhetoric fits. I think there's a better fit for her, though, when we think about political history. A lot of people have forgotten this, but you won't. I think she'd be better go to the Labour Party. Because do you remember when they brought all those young socialists in from around the world to work on their campaign and promise them amazing experiences, et cetera? But actually, they were like being paid below minimum wage, put up in sort of hostile conditions. You know, it was basically migrant exploitation. Um, you know, so you know. it was Matt McCartan's brainchild, wasn't it? I think you're right. So, was that 2014? Yeah, that was in uh, David Cunliffe, uh, the David yes. Cunliffe, uh, election. Yes, that, that was uh, Cunliffe 2014, if yeah. I recall. I thought it was 17, but no, it must have been 14. It's 14. Yeah. But it was overrun by Nikki Hager, helpfully helping John Key get an increased majority. Yes, absolutely. Great election. <laughs> but th so that brings me now to a point where, where you have people involved in the media wishing for something to happen uh, and having the opposite effect. And we we're seeing that in the United States, aren't we? We've got all these media people. I mean, just the other day, there was an article in the Washington Post uh, by, by a guy, and Matt Taibbi at Racket News has highlighted this, uh, it was, you know, in, it was a guy called uh, Cargan, I think. Um, he wrote this article, basically begging that there was a Hinkley-like person out there who would take action to remove the potential dictator. Framing a, an entire article, six thousand words, uh, you know, in the Washington Post, basically describing uh, Donald Trump as a Caesar-like dictator who needed to be removed. And then we get an attempted assassination. Yeah, it, look, the, the America, especially the rhetoric there, um, it's something I'm quite passionate about avoiding in New Zealand mm. because I think uh, it doesn't go anywhere good. You need to be able to say, we think the other side's crap, we think their policies are bad, they don't work. But not that, you know, having them come in will be an existential threat to the country. Yeah, we, we have got people that do that in New Zealand, though, don't we? We, we saw, uh, you know, just after the attempted assassination of Trump, Martin Bradbury from the Daily Blog was ranting and raving that this is now going to enable the MAGA mobs to uh, conduct retribution against Democrats and all of this highly inflammatory language that was coming from him. And here's the interesting thing, actually. Was there a single violent protest around the United States in the wake of what was a what one centimetre, no, quarter of a centimetre uh, gap between assassination? No, there was no violence anywhere. And you do have to say that the worry would be if it had been the other way around, that you might actually have had violent riots um, or, as the media call them, mainly peaceful, uh, break out, you know, everywhere. So actually, you know, you can have your views on Trump. Everyone knows I am a long, long way from a Trump fan, but his response has been very conciliatory. It's been calling for unity, etc. cetera. Uh, the exact opposite of what Martin Bradbury was saying. Yeah, exactly. And, and then, you know, Melania Trump came out and put a, a very personal message, uh, you know, on Instagram as well, there's there's no calls for retribution. There's no there's no riots in the street because someone tried to assassinate you know their team member, uh, so they go and riot and do all these sorts of things. None of that has happened, and in fact, you're starting to see the unraveling of this narrative that the media and the Democrats have built 
the market people are mad and um and and you know they're a threat to democracy when in actual fact if you look at all the evidence of the threats to democracy it comes from the other side yeah look, it's, well i think extremists are extremists and it's a bit interesting the shooter like there's still stuff to come out because it is possible this guy just picked trump because he wanted to become famous. He was the, yeah, this is what we know so far. He was bullied at school, um, et cetera. And maybe if it wasn't a Trump rally nearby, it would have been his school. I mean, thank goodness only um, one person other than him was killed there, et cetera. But mm. we don't actually know what the motivation was yet. But yeah, it's changed history. Like this is a, a iconic moment uh, I think because of the visual images where you can actually see the bullet flying past his head. You can see him bloodied in front of the flag, et cetera. But I guess it's also a bit different, Cam, to other assassination attempts where it's been people in office where that's also incredibly bad. But this, uh, yeah, people interpreting this as this is someone trying to take away our rights to decide who should be president. Mm. Uh, it, look, it's huge. I mean, the the, the as you say, the iconic uh, photographs and video of this, you know, Trump uh, speaking, uh, go, puts his hand to his ear, comes away with blood on it, uh, immediately goes to ground, and then he's standing up defiant, you know, pumping his fist, uh, you know, saying, you know, getting a chant going, USA, USA. Uh, and then standing there with the American flag, their blood all over his face. Uh, he's almost like he's saying, um, if you losers, you missed. Yeah. He reminds me a bit, and only in this aspect, of Theodore Roosevelt, who, when he was campaigning to be president, was shot, actually, in the body. Mm. But thought, oh, yeah, it's not too bad. He's Yeah, he was an outdoor huntsman, et cetera. And he carried on doing <laughs> his speech for another 90 minutes. <laughs> and then they had a look and the bullet was so far in, he was like, oh, just leave it there. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it, it's tough. It, could you imagine? I mean, there, there's all those memes flying around now, you know, um, Donald, Donald Trump standing defiant up to a bullet and there, there's um, Joe Biden can't cope with stairs. Yeah, I, yes. Um, well, look, from the – Trump, I think, sometimes the luckiest person in politics because – um, to have this happen, not that it's lucky to get shot at, don't get me wrong, but the whole focus has been, is Joe Biden too feeble, too weak? And people have made the case, well, yo, Trump's only three years younger and he says some stupid stuff, yo, when he does speeches too. But at the end of the day, the hill gets blown away, that's not meant to be a pun, by the fact you have that presence of mind to you know, shake your fist and not be fearful for your life after a bullet's actually taken part of your ear off as against what's been seen to someone who looked like a half-animated corpse during a debate. And, and, I mean, that's, that's exactly what you, we're seeing. We're seeing Joe Biden... Uh, who is completely feeble, uh, diminished. He appears weak, and there's this fist-pumping Trump uh, in stark contrast with in front of mobs, uh, throwing almost throwing off his Secret Service detail. It's almost like, you know, the, the cartoonish person who's being wrestled to the ground with superhuman power throws them away and pumps his fist in the air. Yeah, I can't be taken out. That's what he's saying, and that's what it looks like. Yeah, yeah, it was, you know, the, I don't think you could have stage managed it. Be, no, I'm not saying it was stage managed uh, there. It was something that I've been reflecting on for the last 24 hours because, yeah, you sort of, you don't realise quite what an iconic moment of history you're living through is if the wind had been slightly different and had killed him, what would have happened to the country there? And it's not, I would have thought in that case that he would probably be replaced by his son, Donald Jr., who would probably be 
far more vengeful than people say Trump Sr. is, yeah. Biden would probably not stand because he says the only reason he's standing was to stop Trump. And it would be fascinating if they'd, you know, this is a what-if scenario, but if given Newsom had become the Democratic candidate, because, of course, his ex-wife or girlfriend is now married to Donald Trump Jr., so you'd have the two candidates for president uh, having uh, been partners with the same woman. Now, that didn't happen, but, you know, if it had killed him, uh, I think it would have been an incredibly darker turn of events for for the US. I think so. But in the in all of this this moment, this iconic moment, we're seeing the US media be clown themselves because there was CNN ran a headline that Trump had stumbled on, on stage and the secure and the Secret Service had taken him off stage. Yeah, I, I, and this is where the satire sites become so good because you've had parody CNN headlines about Trump stumbles, grazes, bullet twist head. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Exactly. Yeah, you know, um, I'm waiting now for the media to come out and say Trump did, brought this on himself. Yeah, you know, but we've already seen some Democratic senators uh, making those sorts of claims. We've had one uh, Democratic congressman who's had to fire a staff member who tweeted that um hope that the next time the shooter gets some, um, you know, uh, doesn't coach, miss, yeah. better aim, yeah. coaching so that they don't miss. You know, yeah. like are they to- that tone deaf to the or, or are they actually just saying out loud what is said behind closed doors in Democratic offices? I think that's probably thinking out loud, yes. Yeah, in which case there is a real problem uh, in US politics where you've got one side of the equation who wants the other side dead, literally. Yeah, and look, as I've said, I'm not a Trump fan. I think his he's unfit to be president in many ways, but also, that's just my view as a New Zealander, the way to stop Trump if you don't like him is not to vote for him and to vote for someone else. <laughs> you know? And you know, not not to uh, think that this is something which which justifies violence because you know we've seen that where someone shot up four or five Republican congressmen. I think at uh, ba- was it baseball game cam? Yeah, yeah, it was. Yeah, they shot them up at the baseball game because yeah. they didn't agree with them. We don't need that sort of nonsense. You should, this is what I've been saying on this this show since I started it. We need to have discourse. And it might be uncomfortable and it might be um, annoying and you might not agree with what the other person says, but we can't, we can't all agree on everything. No. Um, but we have to respect the right of people to be able to express their feelings that they disagree with that. Yeah, absolutely. And that's why, yeah, um, I think there is a push that way. You know, the, the, there's been the cancel culture, and now there's hopefully what we're seeing is a sort of pro free speech push. Because in the end, being able to to disagree publicly <laughs> that stops it getting bad. Yeah, oh, absolutely stops it getting bad. Now let's just park a US politics for a while. I mean, I'm looking at what Nate Silver's saying. What was he saying? Sixty five percent a couple of weeks ago after the debate that he thinks yeah. that. Trump, well, that's got to be up to 75% now, isn't it? Yeah, well, that's pretty close to where the prediction markets and the odds are too. And instinctively, it probably feels right. As we're saying, look, you know, one in four chance that Biden or whoever replaces Biden um, comes through is is pretty significant still. But, you know, it, it it's pretty hard to see the path because – not only does Trump have a massive lead now in the Arizona, Georgia, Nevada type yeah. states and a more modest lead in the Rust Belt, but there's some talk that states like Maine and even New York are coming into play. And it's not that Trump will necessarily win them, but if the Democrats have to start spending money in those states, mm. they're going to have less money to spend in the other states. Yeah, you know, and this is how you win. It's actually forcing the other side to 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 spend uh, less effectively. The um, yeah, I was just thinking about about that exactly. The the having to spend money in New York would 
really, uh, really annoy the Democrats significantly, e even in New Jersey. If they're spending money there, that that is called shoring up the base in in common parlance, yeah. right? That's also, trying to. So, how much do they spend on the presidency, yeah. or do they think that's bad use of money and spend it on shoring up competitive House and Senate races? Yeah, and 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 they they look at saving the republic by trying to get a majority in in the House or in the Senate to to stop Trump. You know, yeah. That, that because it's it's obvious to them that that their candidate's not going to get there in the presidency. But American politics is funny. If you if your lead person isn't performing, that does significantly affect the down ticket. Well, this is why so many have come out to say Biden should withdraw. And if the assassination attempt hadn't happened, I wouldn't have been surprised if um more had come out in the next week or so because they're running out of time. You know, the reports are that that Obama and Pelosi are quietly trying to to nudge them out. It may be that what's happened, though, may stop that purely on the basis of if you now think there's no way we can win, then you're probably better to stay with the incumbent and keep people fresh for next time than send someone in for what's going to be a pretty difficult task. But Trump will be thinking of the future. I mean, he's one of those guys that, that thinks further ahead than just one term. He'll be thinking that I need to be to choose the right person for my vice president so that they can carry on the legacy after I finish my you know, statutory two-term limit. Yeah, and they're saying J.D. Vance is the front runner, but we'll find out because, of course, Trump is a consummate showman, is going to have it announced at the convention. They've kept it very tight. And, of course, the convention's going to be quite different theatrics now, too. They're always theatrics, but having survived this assassination attempt, there's only going to be one focus, yeah, and that's going to be Trump. Well, I, but he's going to milk this. I mean, he, he will. I mean, I would if it was me. Uh, the, the next thing that will happen is he'll go to the funeral of the guy that was killed who was a former fire fire chief in that town who uh, who literally threw himself in the way of the bullets to protect his daughter. Uh, so I can see Trump turning up to that funeral easily. Yeah, I think it's very likely because – <laughs> I'm not sure how much you follow things on Twitter, but there's a Twitter account called Cat Turd, and you might think, <laughs> yeah. what sort of account is Cat Turd? Well, it's probably the most popular pro-Trump account on Twitter. Um, it's got millions of people. I'm not even sure if we know who's behind it, but quite moving is that he, and as a he had said yesterday, you know, why are you all up to? And one of the replies came from this guy who got killed saying, uh, yeah, off to the Trump rally with my daughter. Uh, and so that's made it very poignant because, yeah, this 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 was someone who was interacting with people in Trump world, et cetera. So, yeah, and also we, we are putting aside that, that part, you know, it's terrible that someone, you know, attending a political rally should end up dead. And, of course, there's going to be investigation into how the Secret Service, you know, allowed the guy to get so close. Yeah, I'm, I'm still just perplexed at the media portrayal of all of this. You know, you've got Stephanopoulos uh, and, and Raddatz blaming Trump for contributing to violent rhetoric. It, the violent rhetoric is has been coming from Democrats, and and this is the logical conclusion of this. I mean, if they can hurl uh, accusations at Sarah Palin for a map that had crosshairs on plate, various places they were targeting for you know for winning in, in in polls, then why can't they do the same here for the clear things that Biden has said? You know, when he says you know, he needs to be in the bullseye, um, you yeah, can't, it's a double standard. Yeah, it's a double standard, and and the, but the media are just pushing this narrative. But I just and that doesn't matter now. To the account and, and just outing Democratic staffers, yes, you know, about all of these people. Well, this is the one that said, uh, "I don't condone violence, but please get you some shooting lessons so you don't miss next time." You know that that was a Democratic staffer, ironically, of the same Democratic. Uh, uh, 
uh, representative that tried to pass a bill in the House to say that convicted felons don't don't deserve to have um, secret service protection. Secret service protection. Hello. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and this is why there's going to be blowback for things like that. There's going to be the investigation into the Secret Service response, plus the motives of the shooter. Um, so that, that means this isn't a one-day or even a one-week issue. It, it, it's going to carry on, you know, uh, for some time. Which is going to make it even harder for Biden. He's not going to get a word in edgeways, you know, anymore. You're going to have Trump, who's probably you know, on the phone to Winston asking if he's got uh, Chimbawamba's contact details so he can use um, their song for him because it's yes. more appropriate than, than Biden, who who used it at, at a, a stump speech the next day after he failed so dismally in the debate. Yeah. Anyway, I think we've uh, we, we've talked about polls. We've talked about the US. Um, it's all very interesting, David, but uh, – you're a busy man, so I better let you get back to the school holidays and your kids. That sounds great. Thanks, Cam. Okay, thanks, David. There's some really good insights from David Farrer there. He always has the data so he can argue his point from the certainty of that data. Never bet against him, that's for sure. He knows more than most, and that's why he's here on The Crunch. What do you think? Email inbox at realitycheck.radio or text to 2057. Thank you for tuning in to RCR, Reality Check Radio. If you like what you're listening to or dislike what you're listening to, either way, we want to hear from you. Get in touch with us now. You can text us with your message to 2057. That's 2057. Or email us at inbox at realitycheck.radio. We would love to hear from you, so connect with us today.